Welcome to Cumbeat House. This is the last, you'll be delighted to know, in the series of introductory pathology lectures that form part of the movement and musculoskeletal biology lectures for year two students of UCL. And this lecture deals with growth and development. This is, I think, an interesting topic because the musculoskeletal system is obviously integral in the way in which creatures develop, since throughout development you must remain a going concern. So what is interesting is how you reach the final full size while being able to function along the way, and the, the musculoskeletal system has some solutions for that. The title of the first slide is taken from the great 20th century biologist J.B.S. Haldane, who wrote an essay on being the right size. It was typical of his innovative thought that few people before him had considered that the size an animal is makes a great difference to its life. We've all heard, for example, that mammals survived the event that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs because mammals tended to be smaller. Similarly, it's clear that some animals have an advantage of size in being very large and that, for most land animals at least, they need to reach the right size. Development is therefore programmed. This is not something we should take for granted. If you look at fish, for example, they tend to keep growing and growing and growing so the stories of there being some very large fish out there somewhere are probably true. If you look at the lengths of fish, there's a long tail at the upper end with a very few very old fish that are very big indeed. And of course it's highly appropriate that fish length should follow a Poisson distribution. In view of recent events, I feel I should point out that while I admire Haldane as one of the greatest biological thinkers of all time, that does not mean I subscribe to his views. I do not think, as Haldane wrote in 1962, that Joseph Stalin did a very good job, as by that time he had directly killed almost a million people, nor would I consider treason, nor am I a lifelong advocate of eugenics. Haldane has links with UCL, there's a Haldane room, there's a series of lectures to honour Haldane, and I'm just glad that UCL is an enlightened institution that does not try to erase people from history simply because they hold views that we would no longer find acceptable. All mammalian bones form in similar ways. Growth is programmed for the animal to reach the correct size. Differential growth does much to explain how animals with the same basic body plan can evolve into a variety of different forms. As almost everybody knows, a giraffe has the same number of cervical vertebrae as a mouse. Mammals have an endoskeleton as opposed to an exoskeleton. An exoskeleton is, as its name suggests, an external skeleton such as those found in Crustacea. The reason for this is to facilitate growth. The monstrous creatures with apparently impregnable exoskeletons, so beloved of the makers of modern alien movies would be vulnerable because in order to grow they would have to molt and you could just squish them before their new exoskeleton had hardened again. Bones form out of mesenchyme, are formed of cartilage and then transform into bone, a process known as ossification. This happens in a specific way in the foetus. So you can date a foetus by looking at its ossification centres. They begin around eight or nine weeks in the clavicle and by term, all of the bones are, almost all of the bones are ossified, but ossification continues until maturity is reached. So in immature individuals, the skeleton can be dated by radiography. Unlike most other tissues, bones form from adding material to the edges, appositional growth, rather than the whole organ dividing and getting bigger. Bone can form in two different ways. The simpler way is called intramembranous ossification. This is typically seen in flat bones, such as the bones of the skull, 
in which mesenchyme is directly replaced by bone. The bones of the neonate are incompletely formed. Do not try this at home. If you push down on the fetal skull, it's rather like a ping pong ball, so you can push it in and then it will pop out again. And this is important because the fetal skull has to get through the pelvis and while there's some movement between the bony plates, they also need to deform in order for parturition to occur. Here we see in a histology picture, flat bone developing out of mesenchyme, trabeculae form, the bone ossifies, intramembranous ossification. The second type of bone growth is known as endochondral ossification, where long bones grow at the ends. They have a growth plate, a cartilaginous growth plate. This was first shown by John Hunter, uh, another brilliant biologist and extremely unpleasant man. He was a vivisectionist who implanted lead shot into the legs of chickens, not thank heaven by shooting them, and then saw which bit of the bone grew by seeing which lead pellets moved apart. And the answer was you had to have a pellet at the end of the long bone before it would move apart. If you put both pellets in the shaft of the long bone, they would not move apart so much. The reason that animals have these growth plates is so that the bone maintains its structural integrity during growth. There is only the epiphysis, where there is some mobility, the shaft of the bone can ossify. This is a long bone forming out of mesenchyme, becoming cartilaginous, and then ossifying. If we look at the epiphyseal plate, or growth plate, you can see that there is cartilage, and the chondrocytes are stacked up like stacks of coins. As they develop, they're moving towards the shaft of the bone, and they go through, I'm reading this because I've never found any reason to memorise it, despite practising pathology for 25 years. So they start off as reserve cells not doing anything, then they proliferate, they hypertrophy, and finally the matrix around them begins to calcify. And then bone forms, which is ossification. When bone is formed, the collagenous bony matrix will calcify automatically because hydroxyapatite crystals will be deposited there. This is a consequence of the structure of the bone. It doesn't need to do anything in order to undergo calcification. The difference between calcification and ossification is that calcification is just the deposition of crystals, whereas ossification is the formation of a trabecular bony structure. In order for the trabecular pattern of the bone to form, the bone has to be functional and weight-bearing. When growth is complete, transverse bars of bone form across the lower part of the epiphyseal plate, which is known as fusion of the epiphysis. The cartilaginous portion then atrophies. The bone has reached its final length, and its structural integrity is fully developed. Just to summarise the differences between intramembranous and endochondral ossification, intramembranous ossification replaces embryonic mesenchyme, endochondrial ossification replaces cartilage, intramembranous is largely an intrauterine process, whereas endochondral continues until the late teens. The reason that bones have a trabecular structure is partly to make them lighter. That's the answer you always get if you ask people, why is there a trabecular pattern inside a bone? The bony cortex is solid. And then when you crack a bone open, it has this meshwork of bony spicules within. Well, it's partly to make them lighter. It's also to make them stronger, because something with a strut-like construction is stronger than something solid. Uh, for example, the Eiffel Tower, or one of these primitive aeroplanes, is composed of struts, is light and strong, whereas a piece of chalk is solid and breaks easily. So the structural integrity 
of a cancellous bone is greater than it would be if it were solid. It does, however, need to bear weight, and the structure of the bone itself will alter according to the pattern of weight bearing that occurs in order to improve its tensile strength. Let's look at some abnormal bone growth. Too little bone, too much bone, or problems with ossification. The best example of too little bone is dwarfism. These are achondroplastic dwarfs. We have two examples. On the left is an example from classical Rome. This is a gladiator. Um, the Romans found it amusing to pit achondroplastic dwarves against people suffering from gigantism to see who would win in the arena. Uh, this figure was holding a sword, but the, the blade of the sword has been lost, so only the, the pommel remains. But this, this was a fun day out in uh, ancient Rome. Uh, most of my time at school was spent with the teachers trying to convince me that uh, classical Rome was civilised, but they never succeeded in doing so. On the right is a, an achondroplastic dwarf painted by Velázquez at the court of the King of Spain. He's a much more sensitive character. He looks rather melancholy. The attraction of having dwarves in your entourage was not for entertainment value, but because in the early modern period you showed your intellect and enlightened approach to the world by surrounding yourself with strange and exotic things because to collect all kinds of different things from around the world was a sign of, of greater knowledge and that included different kinds of peoples. Inheritance is autosomal dominant but there is a very large number of new mutations so you don't have to worry if neither of the parents is an achondroplastic dwarf. The following descriptions refer to heterozygotes because the homozygous form is typically lethal in utero and it is sadly relatively common because achondroplastic dwarfs have a tendency to marry each other. Homozygotes die as many infants with skeletal dysplasias do of a low thoracic volume and therefore respiratory insufficiency. Most people are familiar with the characteristic features. Short limbs, depressed nasal bridge, prominent forehead. Intelligence and longevity are, of course, normal. Here's an example of achondroplasia from Old Kingdom Egypt. This is Seneb, an official of some importance, with his wife and daughters. One may reflect on how different Western civilization would have been had it had been founded on a civilization such as that of Egypt rather than Rome. This is a diagram of the growth plate in achondroplasia and of course it's fused prematurely, stunting the growth of the long bones. There are also histological differences but there's no real reason for histological examination because it's not difficult to make the diagnosis on the basis of morphology. Brittle bone disease, osteogenesis imperfecta. Here is a neonate showing some of the characteristic abnormalities. If you look at the limbs, they're angulated because they're fractured. The thoracic cavity is very small. The jaw is small, micrognathia. The mouth is narrow. There's a long philtrum. The ears are low set and a simple shape. If you draw a line, through the centre of your pupils and the tops of your external ears fall below that line, they are low set. But don't worry too much. There's, there's quite a distinguished professor of pathology with low set ears, but he always gets offended when I point it out to him. Hasn't done him any harm though. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a spectrum of conditions all related to point mutations leading to abnormalities in collagen formation. Some tend to be lethal in utero, some are milder form frust of the condition. 
It is type 1, the autosomal dominant type, that is milder and can result in survival to adulthood because, of course, in autosomal dominant conditions they have to be associated with adult survival, whereas type 2 is generally fatal in utero. Here's a radiograph showing multiple fractures of all the ribs, the long bones, and the characteristic H-shaped abnormality of the vertebral bodies. And this shows the lower limbs because it was done on a faxatron, so we couldn't fit the whole baby in at once. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a morphological diagnosis, so you shouldn't really need to do histology, but if you do, you find the bony trabeculae smaller and misshapen because of their loss of mass. Not all growth problems, of course, are due to specific problems of bone. Some are due to endocrine problems in general. And as an example of that, we have uh, cretinism or uh, congenital hypothyroidism. Thyroid hormone is essential for growth. If a child that has not reached full height is thyroid deficient, it will also be growth deficient. Also leads to mental retardation. The name cretinism comes from the French for Christian, Chrétien, because it was considered that people with cretinism were unlikely to do any harm. A characteristic facial morphology, hypertelorism, the eyes are set far apart, again there's a long philtrum, a flat nasal bridge, the nose is rather short, and there's hypognathia. The ears are also again low set. Now a rather rare example of lack of bone, but representative of skeletal dysplasias and congenital defects in general. Seckel syndrome, as I call it, named for Helmut Seckel, German-American physician. Also called bird-headed dwarfism, which was regarded as rather pejorative and and then eponyms fell out of favour, so it ended up being called primordial dwarfism. They have characteristic facial features, prominent nose, down-slanting palpable fissures, so the outer corners of the eyes are turned downwards, generally have moderate to severe mental deficiency, but can have a normal lifespan. Inheritance is autosomal recessive. The best known example is a historical one, Caroline Krakami, known as the Sicilian Fairy, was exhibited in a travelling show as the world's smallest woman, was under 10 years old when the painting was made, but was dressed as a, an old lady in order to make her short stature seem more obvious. Caroline was the first recorded case of primordial dwarfism, this of course was before Seckel, was abandoned by her parents, was exhibited in London by an Irish doctor, presented at court, died of tuberculosis, whereon her parents decided they would like the body back for the purposes of exhibition. Now we move on to too much bone, acromegaly and gigantism. Both are due to an excess of growth hormone. The difference is that acromegaly is in mature individuals where the epiphyses are fused and gigantism is excess of growth hormone in infants and children where excess of growth will involve the whole body. To begin with acromegaly, there are characteristic features, a large jaw, a heavy set face. The tongue tends to be large, giving a rather slurred mode of speech. Uh, the hands and feet are large and individuals tend to be considerably taller than average. In the great majority of cases of acromegaly, the cause is a functional adenoma of the pituitary gland that produces growth hormone. It is therefore, in general, not familial. Enlargement of the visible parts of the body is also accompanied by enlargement of the viscera, particularly the heart, which leads to a shortened lifespan because cardiomegaly is associated with cardiac arrhythmias due to difficulty in perfusing a thickened left ventricle. 
Because people with acromegaly have macroglossia and thickening of the vocal cords, they tend to have rather slurred, heavy voices, and in combination with their heavy set appearance, it tends to give them a, a rather aggressive looking air, so they tend to be cast in films as heavies and villains, but they are of normal intelligence. Andre the Giant was a French professional wrestler with acromegaly who also had a film career and perhaps his best film is The Princess Bride, well worth seeing if you haven't already. Gigantism is due to the same type of pituitary adenoma but in a child and if uncorrected will lead to excessive growth. In Western countries children are monitored and are given growth hormone antagonists if they grow beyond what is considered a suitable height. Uh, this leaves people in third world countries who either don't have access to the treatment or in some cases decide that being very tall is an advantage because they can make a living as a, a circus giant or the world's tallest man or whatever. Uh, the downside to that being that because of cardiomegaly life expectancy tends to be short. Here we have Charles Byrne, the Irish giant in the 18th century, was a celebrated visitor to London, again was presented at court. This drawing is probably reasonably accurate when you consider that the average man at the time might not have been much more than five feet tall, and Charles Byrne, sometimes called Charles O'Byrne, but his real name was Charles Byrne, was over seven feet tall, probably seven feet two or three. He did not enjoy his celebrity, but took to the bottle and died young, probably as a result of cardiac failure brought on by a combination of growth hormone excess and alcoholic cardiomyopathy. While he was alive, he was terrified of his body being dissected, and he knew that the surgeon John Hunter had an ambition to do just that. So Byrne arranged to be buried at sea. Unfortunately, Hunter bribed the boatman with the sum of a hundred pounds, which would be something like ten thousand pounds nowadays. So here is Charles Byrne in the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, next to Caroline Krakami. May they rest in peace. That concludes the series of introductory lectures on pathology. So from the Galton Room here at Convict House, I, I'm kidding, kidding, I'm only kidding. It's actually the Joseph Stalin Room, the Galton Room's next door. Goodbye.